I'm here today with Paul Johnson, Chief Executive of AIM Listed Power Metal Resources, Epic Code POW, a company that is figuratively and literally discovering large scale metal deposits all over the world. Paul, it's good to speak with you. Hello, Alan. How are you? Very well, thanks indeed. Very well. Um, before we discuss the latest developments, there are many London listed mining and resource companies, but aside from the Rio Tintos and Glencores, I can't think of any other small cap companies developing, surveying and drilling the sheer number of projects that you're currently involved in. Can you just explain the big picture here and where you expect the company to develop from here? Yeah, sure. Well, I'm glad you've uh, hinted that we might be unique because that was always our business philosophy, not to uh, just become another run of the mill overhead cost house with an occasional bit of exploration. We want our proportion of uh, business spend to be the highest level possible against exploration and the smallest level against corporate costs. So uh, I suppose that's what we're doing. Uh, I don't think uh, I can think of another company that's active in the way that we are. No, I know no. from the workflow that we are continuously busy and uh, it's not quite a game of throwing darts at the dartboard hoping to hit the treble 20, but there is an element of that in the resource business. It's high risk. Uh, the chance of you finding something of material substance is quite low. You can increase the odds by being well financed by having a portfolio of some substance with some very good projects within it. And then by spending that money on a, a range of different exploration techniques uh, around the project portfolio. So we are doing all of those things. We're in a strong position. Uh, we see our chance of making a major discovery or discoveries to be uh, reasonable uh, you know given the uh, the the risk of our marketplace we think we are operating faster better more intelligently than the average player in the market and uh, we hope that that yields the returns for our investors who are shareholders who have the stock and follow the story well certainly looking at what shareholders are saying out there they are very excited about the potential and they are following the story just want to move on to the projects now. Now, if we spoke about all the projects in detail, we'd be here all day and all night, literally. So what I'd like to do is just, you have a very good slide on the website that sums up uh, all the projects individually. So I'm going to bring these up now. So the first slide, Paul, can you just take us through each, each uh, project here? I know with Australia, for example, you have two projects currently on the go. Yes, we do. Uh, I think we've approached each of our projects in the different jurisdictions. We want to have, uh, we want to have uh, one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, project packages compared to our competitors. Remember, we're in a competitive business uh, on the stock market. We are trying to secure investors' money against the other companies around us that have uh, interests in similar areas, uh, and that's a good thing, you know, to to look at your peers, to look at your competing. Uh, uh, friends in different organizations and to say can we be bigger and better than they can and that's what we try to do in every single project area uh, in australia in the victoria gold fields uh, clearly an area of massive interest around the world particularly in australia and also in canada who uh, the canadian investors seem to love the australian stories and particularly the victoria uh, Goldfield stories. We've secured uh, license applications over 2,336 square kilometers of ground in a joint venture agreement where power owns 49.9%. We've recently had three of our 13 license applications granted, giving us 215 square kilometers of ground that we are able to proactively explore on. And within 24 hours or so of those license grants coming in, we've launched uh, our exploration programs on the ground. So very proactive, moving ahead, doing real work. Uh, the opportunities in Victoria, Alan, are very large scale. And uh, you can see by the amount of ground under application and the gold prospectivity, which is evident from the historic database, that we have lots of targets to go at. Uh, there's a lot of work to do, uh, but we are very excited about it. We think uh, with our partners, Red Rock Resources, in this joint venture, we've built uh, a tremendous opportunity. It could stand alone in its own company. It could stand alone in three different companies if we broke the package up. We're looking alongside exploration at doing corporate work, so uh, an IPO uh, of some or all of the interests on the North American Stock Exchange, 
We're also engaging, as you would expect, with various parties who uh, are looking at this package and thinking there might be an opportunity to work with us, uh, joint ventures and the like. Uh, we'll talk about that in more detail if and when it happens. We don't really want to kind of flag it dramatically. Uh, we, we're just pushing ahead on multiple levels. So, yeah, Australia, very exciting for us. Botswana, a, a country I've had a lot of success in and with, and no wonder because it's hugely prospective. And uh, with the T3 discovery, when I was CEO of Metal Tiger, it changed the company's fortunes and uh, transformed the our investors, shareholders' uh, lives in some cases. So very good to be back there. We have a JV with Cavango Resources, where we each own 50%, covering two projects, Ditau Rare Earths and Back in the Kalahari Copper Belt, where we made the T3 discovery, uh, in that uh, in this new joint venture, uh, where we have two licenses just below uh, Hansi, and we are uh, gearing up with lots of pre-drilling exploration to uh, delineate targets for drilling, and hopefully, at Ditto, a nice rare earth discovery, and at the Kalahari Copper Belt, uh, a nice uh, big copper silver discovery. Uh, we're also uh, drilling right now. Uh, we're in the midst of a, a four-hole drill program at the Malopo Farms Complex project where uh, we're earning into a 40% direct project position by spending half a million US dollars on drilling effectively. Uh, we've done two holes out of four, uh, circa 2,500 meters in total. Uh, we've got some very interesting uh, information from the first two holes. We've announced some of our findings uh, which include very thick ultramafic zones, sulfide uh, identified from visible inspection of the core. The big thing, of course, is to do the assay testing of the core that comes out of the ground. And the results from that uh, will tell us an awful lot more about the project. And of course, you never know, could lead to that company transformational discovery. Uh, overall, with our direct shareholding in the uh, Kalahari Key Mineral Exploration holding company in Botswana, we have an effective 51% interest in that project. So again, another meaty stake that Power Metal holds. Sure. And then on to slide two, Paul. Yeah, sure. In uh, Cameroon, we've announced that we're undertaking a review of that project from an exploration and corporate perspective and we'll update the market. So I probably shouldn't say any more at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, Canada Silver Peak Project, a beautiful project, a former high-grade working silver mine where we uh, took on uh, an agreement, an option agreement in mid-2020, decided to push ahead to earn into a 30% project stake. We did some sample testing as part of our due diligence program that yielded uh, nearly 15,000 uh, grams a tonne of silver, which is quite incredible. Uh, we wanted to push ahead and do a drill program, and boy, we really tried in late uh, 2020, but the weather got us. We only managed to do a small proportion of it, but we still managed to get uh, five or so thousand grams a tonne uh, from one of the samples, which was great, and uh, we demonstrated vein continuity, so we're desperate to get back in there when the thaw happens shortly and do more work. And we're also looking at the corporate options for that particular project, because as you know, and as you've seen, there's so much interest in quality silver projects out there. Absolutely. These projects are disproportionately valuable at the moment. So we should look at how we can possibly move that project forward exploration wise, but also corporately. Mm -hmm. uh, you've also the, got the project too, haven't you? That you've just got involved in. Yes, we have. Because we, we've not yet updated this slide, uh, which I will kick myself for later because we try and keep it fully up to date. But in, unfortunately, the, our website uh, and uh, uh, presentation uh, teams, we have them working every week on updates. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've done multiple updates, so we have to catch up a little bit. We've got uh, a project which is in Ontario now where we've acquired three uh, licenses or projects licensed packages or projects uh, to the east of Panther Metals, uh, which is listed in London uh, with the ticker PALM. And they've been doing exploration work. And our package is situated just to the east. And we're to the west of Palladium One, uh, which has been doing exploration work. Uh, we, we are early stage with this, but we think it has tremendous prospectivity. And we're looking forward to cracking on with that project. Uh, that's called the uh, Hemlo North Gold Project. Uh, moving on to the DRC, you see, even sometimes I can't keep up. 
the, uh, the, the DRC project, as with Cameroon, was one of the legacy projects that, came, that was in the business when we restructured and refinanced back in February 19. And uh, we did some termite mound sampling, uh, much to the amusement of many of uh, uh, the people out there, and got some very good uh, copper results. Uh, we identified a 6.8 kilometer long copper anomaly in the heart of the project. We followed up with uh, pitting, mapping and sampling back in early 20. And we got uh, high grade copper and cobalt results when we got the final assays back in. So uh, we moved straight away into a geophysics program, which is happening right now. And that will tell us where we ought to point uh, the drills. Oh, that's what we hope, that we will have drill targets and we can crack on with drilling. We think there's a, a very decent shot at a really good discovery in the DRC, so we're going for it. Uh, in Tanzania, we just finished with our partners, Katoro Gold, the uh, drill, well, the rotary air blast drill program at the Haneti uh, Nickel PGM project. Now, this is a two-stage drill program. It starts with RAB drilling, which will help us to delineate targets for deeper diamond drilling. With the, uh, the samples from this 2,000 meters of RAB drilling have been sent off to the labs, uh, SGS Tanzania, and we're just waiting for the results. Now, we have uh, a 35% interest in that project with Katoro Gold listed in London with the ticket KAT holding 65%. So for both companies... Uh, if we find some success here, this is nickel PGM focused and we're targeting a large discovery or discoveries. If we're successful, it will be company transformational, good quality nickel sulfide projects of substance size and potential commercial development will always be highly, highly valuable. In the USA, uh, we took on in 2020 uh, an earning agreement to earning up to 75% of the Alamo Gold Project. Now, we've been doing work on the ground at the Alamo, which is based in Arizona in the USA. And there's been lots of stuff happening, some of which we've communicated to market and some of which we're still working on. And uh, we've built the size of the project area based on our initial ground exploration. And I hope we can provide a further update to market in the near term. Now, this is Nugget Gold mineralization near surface. And effectively, we're looking for that and we're looking for the bedrock gold source. So a uh, very exciting project for us. Certainly something that could be very sizable in due course. But we just have to go through the, the work and we need to let the market know a bit more about what we're doing. Understand. Well, that's an astonishing amount of work you've got underway there, Paul. Um, I've said on several occasions that the potential value in any one of these projects coming to fruition could dwarf the current market cap of the company. Well, where do you expect the value inflection points to arrive near term for Power Metal? You can actually uh, use that uh, valuation methodology because if, we, with the, if you're going for large scale projects as we are with district scale potential, uh, the kind of stuff that can be uh, significantly transformational. Well, it is like throwing darts at the dartboard. If you hit the treble 20, you get dramatically more points than if you go slightly off to the right or left and get a one or a five. So uh, you could look at any of these interests and say that it has the capability of, of uh, a dramatic valuation versus the existing market cap. The challenge, of course, is, we're not at that point because until we come out to market and we confirm that we've made that major discovery and provide some information about the size and scale and potential commercial development and possible partnerships, then of course the market won't entirely believe you. There's only so long that speculation can carry you forward. And uh, that's why as a business model, uh, I think I need to be better than a pure speculation outfit. I think we need to build ourselves more intelligently than a pure speculation outfit. So what we've done is we've said, look, we are going for a development model where we take in projects into this company. We undertake exploration on all of them where possible. And then we decide, do we want to take a project forward ourselves? And if we do, we take it forward and we... Uh, look for those major discoveries. And we're doing that with some of them right now, as you can see from the news that's coming out. Now, 
pre-discovery or on discovery, we may decide that we need to bring in a partner on an earning joint venture arrangement to take a project forward. If you have, if you have a major nickel sulfide PGM discovery of dramatic size and scale, you might need one of the major or mid-tier firms to come in and to work with you. And they are certainly interested in the type of uh, project that we're looking at uh, because they need that pipeline of good quality projects. Uh, but what we also may do along the way is vend out some of our interests rather than just developing them internally or bringing in big uh, partners to work with us. We may actually vend them out into their own vehicles. Now, by doing that, we then take a project which is essentially an overhead, if you think about it, when it's in exploration or development, and we turn it into an asset on the balance sheet. Then we get shares, we get warrants, we get uh, royalties. Uh, or other forms of financial compensation. And we can build our balance sheet. Now, I think there's an opportunity for us because I've been doing this restructuring, refinancing work for years, and now I only do it for power. That's the, the only uh, uh, focus of my kind of working life is building power. If we do enough of this corporate work and we build our balance sheet <laughs> sufficiently, then we uh, can actually build the size and scale of our assets to justify and more our market cap as we grow. Okay. On top of that, we make major discoveries as well. We become a sizable, financially robust, self-sufficient organization with dramatic inherent net asset value together with uh, the potential for uh, major discoveries along the way. Excellent. Right, Paul. I'm going to put you on the spot now. Okay. If you had to choose, I mean, you've got an astonishing amount of work underway. If you had to choose, which project right now are you most excited about? That's that's a question I get asked a lot. Uh, you know, our model is a hub and spoke model, and that means that we uh, coordinate with a small central team in London. Our operations, we have the board. We're building our team with operational uh, managers, effectively. And we have some in place around the world and we'll have central operational management soon. We'll have uh, internal uh, assistance with communications, uh, with uh, you know financial compliance related matters, all of these things in place as we grow our company. But what our model means is that we don't have large overhead costs at the center. We use teams locally in different jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. And that means that I have to uh, look after those teams. So I may get my point not to say that project a is my favorite because project b's team and c's team will feel a little bit unhappy about that do you have favorites it's a bit like children yes you do have favorites you have projects that you think heck that could uh, be quite amazing uh i have a particular affinity with uh, botswana because of the t3 discovery at metal tiger we, and i have actually lived the experience i've had the phone call that says we have 50 meters of 2% copper. I've had the phone call that says we have a mine. I've gone through that process of seeing the share revaluation and I've had the calls from a small number uh, of investors articulating how it changed their life. So, yeah, you, you always will have a natural affinity. I wouldn't pick a favorite. In our business, we have a, a, an ethos that none of our projects uh, becomes the favorite until it becomes so of itself. You know, so it, when something starts to stand out through exploration success or corporate success, then clearly it will be seen as a favorite by not just the management team, but also by the investors, shareholders in the company. Understood, understood. And Paul, of course, you've achieved all this in spite of the challenge of COVID-19, added to which, of course, the company is in a very strong financial position. Can you elaborate on how that's come to pass? Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, you, you make your most money in our markets uh, by engaging in times of adversity. So when it's a difficult uh, set of market conditions, if you go out there and look for projects and acquire interests and build your business, then uh, you can get things uh, not so much rock bottom value, but on far more effective, keen terms than uh, would ordinarily be available. You can also get things that wouldn't be available in more buoyant markets because projects have access to finance far more easily. Uh, we did that by raising money. We raised uh, 
2.7 million quid. February 19, 1 million. December 19, 0.7 million. And July 20, 1 million. We did that with a warrant back model. So we raised at uh, market price. We wanted, or certainly we did for the December uh, 19 and July 2020. We put a warrant in there as well. The belief was that if we built our business in the way that we felt we could, that our share price would rise then the warrant money would come in behind that share price rise and we could fund and finance ourselves. And now we sit with, you know, circa, well, we published uh, 2.7 million or just over recently mm -hmm. in working capital. And anyone with a calculator can kind of work out we've had a fair amount in since. Of course, we've had some costs out as well. We, uh, we've paid uh, almost all of our project-related costs. Uh, we're ahead of the game on so many of our projects. Uh, or we're up to speed with our payments. We we have no kind of trading debt, as it were, of any material substance. Uh, we have no fundamental debt, so we're free to do what we want with our working capital. So the model has been one of going out there aggressively and building, making sure we had layered finance in there so the money came in if we did our job well, which I think so far we've done okay and the money has come in, and it's coming in on a regular basis, which is great. Of course, the warrant money will burn out, uh, and it, I think it won't be too long. Uh, and then we have to stand on our own two feet, which is why it's important to become financially self-sufficient and, and grow our balance sheet organically if possible. Uh, and, and so that's really it. It's just the model of going for it in, in difficult times. Now, as an investor, you know, when the share prices pull back on stocks, you sit there and you feel a little bit disconcerted and you maybe start to sell a few shares. You don't buy shares when they're at the bottom. Uh, you, you feel nervous. It's the same kind of thing. You make your most money when people are panicking around you and people are not buying. You know, as as a, as a, a great investor once said, not me, Warren Buffett. <laughs> well, no, <laughs> the stock market is the only place where people buy less in a sale. Yes, exactly. It's true. So true. So true. Little Paul, it's been great talking with you. I could talk uh, to, talk with you all night about this, but before we wrap up, can you just provide um, the viewers with some key takeaway points? Yeah, okay, sure. The largest shareholder in Power Metal Resources, the company I run as CEO, is me. Uh, I have 124 million, well, actually, well, I think it's 123.85, but uh, financial instruments made up of shares, 60.5 million, and the rest being share options and uh, warrants from placings or financings I've participated in. If this company rises in value dramatically, the impact on my personal balance sheet, for want of a better term, is dramatic. Now, uh, without wanting to be too misleading, this is just a general calculation. At 10 pence a share, I have 12 million. At 20 pence, 24 million. 50 pence, 60 million. Make up whatever figure you want. It's dramatic uh, for me as an individual. I don't run any other public companies. I've made the mistake in the past of having too many roles and trying to do too much for too many different companies. I'm only focused on one. So my eggs are kind of in one basket. If people put their money with me, we will spend it wisely. We will direct as much money as we can into the ground. Uh, our board salaries as a business are low. Uh, compared to our peers in the sector deliberately. We're incentivized by the shares we hold and share price performance and generally by share price performance, all of us. Uh, we're building a business carefully. I didn't want to add staff uh, into the business until we had circa 2.5 million working capital, so we were totally secure. Now we're, uh, you know, significantly higher than that. We are in a position to build and add team members as we grow our company. We're targeting mid-tier status. We want to be a large organization. To do that, we have to be corporately brilliant. And we have to be uh, very, very fortunate with our exploration uh, strategy and operational implementation. So some of these things are out of our hands. We're in a high-risk business. But I think as a, in the round, on the whole, the fact that the management team uh, are incentivized by share price, the fact that we are financially robust, the fact that we have a long-standing you know, target to be a large company is on the side of shareholders. And I think that compared to many of our peers in the market, we're structured well, we're organized well, and we're focused on achieving the kind of outcome that they as shareholders need. At the end of the day, it's all about share price. 
Paul Johnson, Chief Executive of Power Metal Resources, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Alan.